On the next day, July 20th, 1944, I would celebrate my 23rd birthday, and I wanted to live to see it. On my birthday, I treated myself to a simple but long breakfast. Who knew when I would have time for something like that again? Late in the afternoon, we received news that left us all in surprise. An assassination of Adolf Hitler had been attempted. Varied rumours quickly spread around, none of which seemed reasonable enough to believe it. What was clear, however, was that the attack had to have been carried out by one of our sides, since no one else would have had access to Hitler's closer surroundings. Hitler had survived the attack, albeit not without injury. I could not help but think, the war must indeed have turned in our opponent's favour, if there are now attempts to attack Hitler from within our own ranks. In the middle of this whole situation we received a new movement order. The British were again on the attack around Troan. It seemed like they were starting to break through. Our company was now to reinforce the weakened defenders there. In short order, the whole company had mounted up and was heading towards saint Père, south of Troan. Bratz went ahead in a Kubelwagen with two runners. One of these messengers had orders to meet us shortly before our arrival to relay a situation report. The weather was bad, with light rain and darkness setting in. After a short drive, we halted at Pont de la Rame Bridge. Here, as had been planned, the runner was standing, ready to brief us on the situation. Our vehicles were spaced tightly, and their drivers tried their best to get them into cover on the roadside as well as under the bridge. There was little room, and we also had to keep moving, and so all stayed close together. In the dark of night, the tension was palpable. The assassination attempt was on everybody's minds. Will all this soon be over? How would the end look for us? Like the end of the last great war. Would the Allies' assassination or not be willing to negotiate at all, or keep insisting on unconditional surrender? Judging by how fierce the Allies were fighting, I thought the latter option to be more realistic. Their demand for unconditional surrender. The word unconditional, however, made us resent this option. It would mean that all our sacrifices would have been in vain, and that we could expect another catastrophic peace treaty like after the last world war. All of this went through my mind as I disembarked from my gun carrier. The runner greeted me, and we went to a small house next to the bridge. Only inside did he light up his pocket lamp in order to not risk us getting spotted from afar while he showed me the way on a map. We had just closed the door when all of a sudden everything was covered in blazing light and the door was jolted open again. Almost the same instant there was a shock wave and the hard bang of an explosion. Both of us instinctively dropped prone near the wall. After a short minute, the artillery strike was over. We kept on lying on the floor for a few seconds, practically paralysed. The door had been torn from its hinges and lay in the middle of the room. Smoke and dust crept in from the outside. I recognised the flaring of fires and the first sounds reaching our ears did bode ill. Medics were called for, ammunition was exploding. I stood up and ran out. What I saw was a chaos of burning vehicles, smouldering debris and screaming men beyond description. The artillery had struck right in our midst. Soldiers were crawling out under the vehicles, their faces blackened. Others were nothing more but twisted husks of smouldering flesh and scraps of uniform, I hurried towards my self-propelled gun. Right before it I found one of my NCOs, his name was Herring, lying on the ground. One of his legs was hanging on his thigh only by a few muscle strands, and his blood was spreading around him in a large puddle. The man, however, was surprisingly collected. Bracing himself on an arm, he yelled commands towards the crew. Just as I kneeled down next to him, a medic arrived, who immediately tied off the upper leg and turned the lower one, which was protruding at an unnatural angle, to align with the other one, as if rearranging this gruesome picture would make things better. Only when the NCO saw this, he became aware of his situation. His face abruptly turned white, and he sank down on his back. I grasped his hand tightly and supported his shoulders. The medic nodded at me, and I stood up again to look for the others. When I wanted to let go of his hand, the NCO squeezed it one more time. I hesitated for a moment, but then bowed down to him again. The words, too bad, lieutenant, softly escaped his lips. He let go and slowly sank down with a groan. I said, everything is going to be all right. Hold on, before forcing myself to turn around. It was no good. My leadership was needed. I tried to bring some order in the chaos. I sent men from here to there, patted all of them on the shoulder and gave each a task. 
At the very first, we dragged the dead and wounded out from under the vehicles and made sure that the medics could do their job. Over time, we found ourselves again. It was obvious, however, that we had to get away as quickly as possible. After a few seemingly endless minutes, the situation was under control again. I counted four dead and six wounded, some of them severely. Ten casualties. Considering our already reduced numbers, this was quite a lot. Sadly, the NCO had not been the only wounded of my anti-tank platoon. Another of my soldiers had been gravely wounded, but our company was still lucky under these circumstances. The self-propelled guns remained undamaged and only a few trucks had been destroyed. I ordered all to mount up and, led by the runner, we went ahead to St. Pear with our dead and wounded, the survivors heavily battered. Deploying our company at Troan was now out of the question for the time being, but we immediately started regrouping the gun crews. Our dead and wounded were picked up in the same night already by ambulances that carried them to the next field hospital. What eventually became of our wounded, we were not told. This was how July 20th, 1944, the day of the assassination attempt on the Führer, ended for us. Because of the events surrounding the artillery strike, this attempt completely faded into the background. Only days later would we come to grapple with it. One realization became more and more clear to me. If you want to leave this war alive, you need more than pure luck. Even today, many years later, I have had not a single birthday on which I do not have to think about this nightly slaughter at Pont de la Ramé. The British attack on Troan on July 20 was repulsed without us, but only under heaviest losses on our side. Slowly but steadily, a fatalistic mood set in everywhere. The enemy's material superiority was utterly ineffable. The weather had worsened over the course of July 20th, however, with the beginning of a long period of rain, which soon turned the loamy plains east of the Orn into a vast field of mud, preventing any further armoured advance. The following hours were characterised by artillery duels. As both sides did not want to give each other too much peace, they resolved to throwing shells at each other. For each and every one of our artillery shells, however, we got twenty back from the Tommies. Then we received more bad tidings. A salvo of our own artillery had come too short and hit right in our main battle line. Four soldiers could only be recovered dead. Not only could we barely return fire, but once we were actually firing, we also hit our own positions. Our men acknowledged this in silent resignation. Upon looking in their eyes, however, I could clearly see how much resentment they were trying to hide. Within these pauses in the direct combat, there were also signs of humanity. On the next day, we witnessed a ceasefire being spontaneously agreed on by both sides. Fighting around Troan and saint Père had been so fierce, there had been barely any time to recover the wounded. By now they were lying on the battlefield, unprotected for hours or even days. In the night, we could often hear their screams of lament coming from no man's land. Only when it ceased, we knew that it was over for the poor devil. Many only succumbed to their grievous wounds after days of agony. Their calling was almost too much to bear at night. No man who once hears it will ever forget it. At once, ambulances were driving up on the opposing lines, their sides marked with large red cross flags. Trusting our sense of fairness, they slowly closed in on our positions. Not a single shot was fired. Now, for a few hours, the guns were silent and both sides recovered their dead and wounded in the pouring rain. The medics were helping each other wherever they could. Everyone was recovered, whether friend or foe. After this time, the British and their ambulances went off again. In one of them, an English officer was standing bold upright. Upon passing by, he saluted us. Later, I was told by one of our medics that the man was a British physician who, in summer 1939, right before the war, had been studying at Heidelberg, Germany. In the evening of July 21st, the horror caught up with us again. We were lying in the garden of Chateau Saint-Père, where we had installed our command post. Battalion command had put us into reserve due to our earlier losses. At the time, we were coordinating our possible uses at the front lines when we were once again hit by an enemy artillery strike. The first shells whistled in, and before we knew it, we were already in the middle of a bombardment. Like a hunted hare, I ran through the exploding landscape up to the chateau and into its cellar. I had not been the only one to come up with that idea, and together with other soldiers we hurriedly funneled down the stairs. 
Once we were down there, we could listen to the roaring of British artillery shells striking all around the building. The chateau basement was only half below the surface, and once the high cellar windows were smashed open, dust blown up by impacting projectiles was creeping in. The noise was deafening and almost unbearable. When the pressure of a detonation coming through the cellar window staggered me, I spread my arms to find something to hold on. Trying to regain my balance, I reached left and right, and suddenly my fingers encountered resistance by a sticky, warm something. Shocked, I looked to the side and saw how the soldier next to me fell down on his knees. A piece of shrapnel had whizzed through the window, cleanly splitting his head in two from the forehead upwards. My hand had grasped the inside of his head. I recoiled and stared eyes wide open on the twitching body that slowly vanished before me under a blanket of stirred-up dust and dirt. It seemed as if time was standing still for a blink of an eye. I threw myself into a corner and tried to be as flat as possible. After a few minutes, this bombardment came to an end as well. Almost trance-like, I stumbled towards the stairs. By now I had seen quite a lot, but this had been nothing but pure horror. I tried to not look at the soldiers who had been deadly hit and climbed up the steps on all fours. The chateau and its garden had been hit bad. Half of the building's roof was gone, with the upper floor being almost completely exposed. Scraps of paper were falling down to the ground. I bent down and picked up a postcard. It depicted the chateau in its undestroyed state. What an irony of fate. Without giving it a second thought, I put the card into my pocket. In total, we suffered almost ten men killed. This was a shock. My guardian angel, as by now I was quite certain that I had to have one, had protected me from the worst once again. In contrast to the artillery strike at the bridge, my platoon did not suffer any casualties during this bombardment. At the bridge I had lost two men to shrapnel, but this time we had enjoyed good cover. Only I had almost gotten it. In the meantime, I had received two new soldiers from Bratz. My anti-tank platoon was his strongest asset, and he did not want it to remain weakened. Thus, I could reinforce my gun crews, and was now back to having fourteen men under my command. These recent surprise fire attacks left us entirely convinced that the French resistance was keeping their eyes glued on us. How else could it be that we had been hit in such a targeted manner? We were not directly at the front line, camouflaged well in flat, wooded terrain, and the rainy weather did not allow for enemy aerial reconnaissance. Then, where did these targeted artillery strikes come from? We all were full of anger at the unknown enemy. The effects of this resentment would not be long in coming. After the bombardment, I stood together with my soldiers to assign them as gun crews when I saw an NCO of the company command squad approaching. Before him walked a French civilian, visibly scared to death. The sergeant had drawn his pistol and shoved the Frenchman, who must have been around thirty-five years old, in front of him. The man wore nothing but trousers and a shirt and had no papers with him. The two of them headed straight towards me. Dismissing my soldiers, I waited for the sergeant to come closer. The NCO was visibly agitated. Without letting me say anything, he panted out, "'Lieutenant, sir, we just apprehended this man. I was ordered to shoot him as a spy.' Lieutenant, sir, I can't do this. I am sorry, but I simply can't do it. I had thought long about a situation like that. I went closer to the sergeant, pulled him to the side and sternly told him, Listen to me. You will take this man now, go to the edge of the village, and after the last house you look around and find out if anyone can still see you. Then you send the man away. Make him understand that he is free to go. Once he is away, you return to me and report the execution. Understood. With wide eyes, the NCO stared at me, dumbfounded but also delighted. He confirmed my order with the words, Yes, Lieutenant, sir, turned around and went off with his prisoner. I took a deep breath and waited. After some minutes, the sergeant returned, somewhat insecurely reporting, Order carried out, before disappearing again. Much relieved, I called for my soldiers again. However, one might think about this situation, I am convinced to this day to have done the right thing. Even if the civilian had been a resistance member, how could it have been proven? I think that my men knew all too well what I had said to the NCO, but none of them ever brought it up. And perhaps deep inside they approved of how their lieutenant had handled that situation. Any of them could have reported my actions just like that, but no one did. They stuck with me. Who had ordered the sergeant to shoot the man, I do not know to this day. It could not have been First Lieutenant Bratz.
I had always witnessed him to be very correct. Those two artillery's strikes and the resulting high losses had been too much for all of us, however. The nerves of everyone were strained. Maybe there had been actual evidence regarding the Frenchman. I do not know, and I will never find out. In times of war, the line between personal guilt and innocence is only a thin one. A final attack, our company was spared from the heavy fighting that 21 Panzer Division was going through at the end of July 1944. Because of recent losses, Battalion Command did not judge us ready for action. As such, by now less than 40 soldiers of our company first marched east in early August before joining up with the rest of the battalion in the Lassie area in the morning of August 5th. On the march back, I saw some of our own fighter planes fly towards the enemy. At first, we suspected them to be Allied attack aircraft and immediately drove our vehicles off the road, but then identified them as German Messerschmitt BF-109 fighters. Flying low, they zoomed over the French fields. Our men cheered and waved at their pilots. Under the plane's fuselages, we thought to have seen bombs. But when they returned some time later with the same bombs still affixed, we realized that these had to be external fuel tanks. Well, in that case, we have to make do with our own hand grenades, one of my men remarked contritely. I knew nothing to say in reply. When we arrived at the regiment, we were appalled by the state we found our fellow soldiers in. All of them were at the end of their ropes. The unrelenting and constant fighting had worn all of them down. The Americans had broken out of their beachhead at Avranches and were standing close to Le Mans in the south, deep in our left flank. It seemed that nobody was stopping them. Our front line essentially ran over multiple hills north and south of Lassie. The highest peak at 1200 Tourbar Leftou, Mont Pinson, northeast of Lassie, had been one of the targets of the British's latest offence. A few days prior, they had begun an energetic push southward. This meant that their offensive line ran in parallel to our positions, making it perfectly obvious that their attack was to support the American advance. At the time, we were situated very close to Mont Pinson, which itself was defended by units of 276th Infantry Division. Beginning on August 5th, the British attempted to capture the hill. In addition, most likely to keep 21st Panzer Division from rushing to the embattled 276th Division's aid, our own positions were also fiercely attacked by British and Canadian troops. Taking or holding the vital peaks was the main objective of both sides. He who has the height has the depths, is what we had been told back at Winsdorf Panzer Forces Academy, and it universally applied to all forces in this conflict. Immediately after our arrival in the Lassie area, I was asked to report to the regiment's commander. Upon entering his office, I was quite surprised to find our division commander, Major General Feuchtinger, standing before me. I saluted which the general acknowledged with a nod, before gesturing towards my regimental commander with a smile. Lieutenant Colonel Rauch nodded as well, and informed me that we had suffered high casualties among the commanding personnel up to that point. He now needed every officer available to lead his subordinate units. Officers like me, who were relatively senior, now had to take extraordinary efforts. After all, I had been in action since the very first day of the invasion. Over the course of these harsh weeks of privation, I had gained a good reputation and, consequently, I was now to take command of one of the Panzer Grenadier companies that had become leaderless. On top of that, I was informed that a counter-attack by our division on the enemy positions at Montpinson, as well as further west, at Aurigny, was planned for the next day, August 6, 1944. This battle group of mine was also to be supported by several of our armoured vehicles. Once the colonel finished, Major General Feuchtinger began to speak. Well, Lieutenant, I was informed that you are a capable man, so I want you to execute this attack with all of your vigour. Do not waste any time. Bring your battle group forward and beat back the enemy. I want your attack to be successful. Do you understand? He said insistently. I replied, Yes, General Sir, to which he nodded affirmingly. Good, Hola, then you are hereby dismissed he finished. I signed off and was shown the way to the soldiers of my new Panzer Grenadier Company. On the way I had to think about the General's speech. On the one hand I felt honoured, but on the other I could feel the pressure that was now resting on me. Leading a battle group was quite a lot of responsibility for a mere lieutenant. Today I know that Major General Feuchtinger was hard-pressed himself at that time. 
there was even the possibility that he could have been relieved of command. His absence on the first day of the landings had not been overlooked among his superiors. Although he had been just promoted to Major General on August 1st, this perhaps had been done in order to convey that impressive results were expected in return. Today I cannot help but believe that the General was dealing with me personally, only because he was in dire need of some success to point to. In this, he probably did not care in the slightest who and how many were sent to the slaughter. My Panzer Grenadier Company in essence comprised around sixty soldiers, who were all obviously more than battle-weary. When I assembled the company's NCOs to introduce myself and explain next day's mission to them, I could see in their faces how they were anything but enthusiastic about the prospect. Nevertheless, they listened attentively. After all, all of our lives were at stake as had been promised, a mixed platoon of Panzer IV and Panzer V. Panther tanks of Panzer Regiment Twenty Two showed up in the evening hours. I briefly conferred with the tank platoon commander, a young sergeant, before lying down with a queasy feeling at midnight to try and get a few hours of sleep. I could not catch any, however. Too many memories of my first assault in Tunisia came to my mind. What will tomorrow bring? I kept asking myself. If things were to go down like in Tunisia, we would have to walk through hell. Back then, I had commanded a platoon of almost forty men. Now it was a company. But with its sixty soldiers, it was barely larger than my old platoon. Around O2, house in the night, we marched to our staging area, which we arrived at without any incidents. Shortly before our attack was planned to commence, things suddenly came thick and fast. Battle noise emerged ahead of us and after a few minutes a runner came rushing in. The British had preempted our attack, going on the offence from the west and north towards mont and the surrounding hills. We were now ordered to immediately advance towards the enemy. We went on the march towards Origny. Our staging area was located in an open forest southeast of the town, which ran up a hill slope. The crest was covered in trees and bushes, with some boulders visible between them. Through the binoculars, we spotted soldiers up there breaking branches off the trees. We could not clearly identify them, but since good camouflage had by now become necessary for our survival, we assumed them to be German troops. We passed by Origny without further incidents, and eventually ended up west of the hill. I conferred with the tank commander about how we should advance through the terrain ahead. To get a better view, we went up to a nearby road. Suddenly we heard engine noise ahead. Before we knew it, a German Kubelwagen came around the corner and stopped right next to us, in which sat a sergeant and a corporal who identified themselves as members of one of our infantry divisions. With the engine still running, they explained that they were stragglers, looking for their home unit. We in turn explained our mission to them, and before we knew it, they turned around their car and drove off in the direction they had come from. The tank commander and I looked at each other puzzled. But just as the Kubelwagen had disappeared behind the corner, a British armoured scout car suddenly emerged from it. The green and yellow striped vehicle came to a halt, its engine humming and turned its turret towards us menacingly. All of this happened so fast that we were completely surprised. The distance to the British Humber scout car was almost five hundred feet. Before we could even drop into the roadside ditch, it opened fire on us. Its salvo came up short, however, the heavy machinigun bullets hitting the road before our feet. Now off we go, both of us thought as we jumped into the ditch, but apparently the British were also unpleasantly surprised to have encountered us as the scout car's engine revved up and it reversed back out of sight. All this had only taken a few seconds. With our hearts pounding, we retreated, returning to our soldiers panting but unharmed. I now ordered the grenadiers to march ahead in a widespread line, followed by the tanks which lumbered forward through the terrain with gunning engines. In case of enemy fire, the tanks had orders to immediately suppress any enemy positions identified. The morning mist had vanished, and the sun rose up. Everyone kept searching the sky nervously. The woodland ended. We reached open ground with a small house on the edge. Then I gave the order to halt. I was walking roughly in the centre of my battle group, immediately next to a Panzer IV. The tank had already left the woodland and was now covering the slope before it with its cannon. Just as I wanted to raise my hand, I heard the characteristic hum of aircraft engines ahead. Everyone winced, 
heads quickly turning in all directions. A moment later we spotted the enemy attack aircraft approaching low over the horizon. Jarbos, short for Jagd Bomber, meaning fighter bombers, a soldier next to me shouted at the top of his voice, Full cover! All tried to disappear from the scene. Some of the grenadiers around me ran up to the tank and threw themselves under it. I wanted to join them but hesitated for a moment and then sprinted towards the house where I dropped down next to the wall. A shadow passed over me, followed by a howl and an enormous detonation. As if in slow motion I witnessed a bomb hitting the Panzer IV, tearing it apart in a mighty explosion. In horror, I had to think about its crew and the grenadiers who had taken shelter under the tank. All were now expecting another bombing run, but to our surprise, this had been the only attack by these fighter bombers. For the next couple minutes, they devoted themselves to the area in our rear. As we would later find out, regimental command would come under attack and take a hammering. After we had recovered from the shock, we began advancing again. We left behind the smoking wreckage of the tank, whose turret had been flung several yards away by the force of the blast. The crew of five as well as five grenadiers were left behind, dead. We turned to the right again, succeeding in taking the next hill without any further air attacks. We were met by some small arms fire, but managed to force the British infantry back. From the rear we then got the order to hold position on the hill until further notice. I made the men prepare for the defence and cover up the tanks in all haste. Now we were safe for the moment. By the end of the day, however, the British had managed to capture Mont Pinson east of our position. With that, the enemy had the area's highest peak in their hands, their flank was secured, and their objective met. In other areas, advancing British units had been successfully delayed by efforts of our artillery. In addition to the assault on Mont Pinson, the British also tried their luck on the point where our 21st Panzer Division was joined to 326th Infantry Division. This time with suitable artillery preparations, but despite the intense bombardment, our troops managed to repulse all British attacks until the evening as well as stabilise the old front line north of Lassie again. In the night, however, long intense enemy artillery fire resumed. Under the flashing lights of exploding shells, we dug deep into the ground and pressed ourselves down in our foxholes. All around us, shells kept ploughing up the landscape. First reports of casualties came in. Luckily, all of them could be treated by the medics for the time being. During the night, I lost contact with the regiment. It became apparent that me and my battle group would not be able to hold this position for much longer. My tanks had withdrawn due to the fierce artillery fire, leaving us alone on the hill. Nobody wanted to run around in the bombardment, and so I resolved to take two of my runners and rush back myself, hoping to re-establish communications with the regiment. Again, we ended up in the middle of a British artillery barrage, but by jumping from one ditch into the next like hares, we escaped it just as well. Finally, we found another runner. The man told me that the regiment's latest attack had failed too, after which our right flank had collapsed. Regimental command had then issued a general order to withdraw. I now tried to hurry back to my company with my two runners. After a short time, one of my NCOs already crossed our way. He had a shrapnel wound in his upper leg which was bleeding profusely. I yelled into his ear to go back. He looked at me, his eyes opened wide, gazing at me bewildered, and kept lurching on towards the rear. We left him behind and kept running forward. The artillery fire ceased, and everything went quiet. We stood at the foot of the hill and looked up. Suddenly we heard combat noise and English shouts ahead. The British were already close by and had commenced their assault. Seconds later, the first bullets whizzed by around us. Everyone took cover wherever they could. I ran across a road and jumped into a field. Again, I heard voices. I squatted down on the ground, as there were obviously British on the road closing in. My company's positions on the hill must have been overrun already, I thought. I rolled to the side and entered a small depression, which, as it turned out to my dismay, harboured a swampy pond. Within a moment I had sunk into the mud up to my breast. The English-speaking voices grew louder and so I froze in the exact position I had entered the mire. I could feel the swamp water quickly soaking my clothes. Once the British had apparently passed me by, I immediately tried to free myself from this awkward situation. I managed to roll out of the mire. Exhausted and covered in mud from head to toe, I crawled into a bush. My gun and camera were left behind in the gargling swamp. 
Over the sound of my pounding heart, I could hear another British scouting party marching past on the road. Once the British had passed by, I started running in the direction of my company. After some time, I found another NCO, who had also been separated from our unit. When he spotted me coming towards him, completely covered in mud, he stopped and looked at me blankly. Only once I told him my name did he recognize me. We first took cover in a ditch. He told me that our company, or rather what was left of it, had retreated on its own after the British assault. We kept on walking and together managed to find our way back to the regiment. The staff there had already thought us to be missing in action. Until evening, some more additional soldiers trickled in. We spent the whole night trying to find our remaining men. In the morning, we finally gave up. I was completely exhausted. I had gone three days without sleep, and my little excursion into the mire had almost been the final straw. With my uniform soiled by dry mud, I must have been a terrible sight to behold. When I eventually assembled the remains of my Panzer Grenadier Company, in the morning of August 8th I counted two NCOs and fourteen other soldiers. No more than sixteen men were left of the almost sixty with whom I had headed out. My company was virtually wiped out. Together with these soldiers, I reported back at the regimental command post to Lieutenant Colonel Rauch. He was surprised to see me again, but immediately offered friendly greetings. He was quite elated, and I quickly saw why. He had been awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross for his actions at the Normandy Front. Rauch told me that, although our attack did not result in a breakthrough, the front line had been successfully stabilized. His adjutant, First Lieutenant Ackerman, had been killed in the fighting a fact which I was shocked to hear, since I had only become acquainted to him a few days ago. Ackerman had also embarked on a special mission similar to mine. Unlike me, he had joined the long list of lives lost in the merciless fighting. I also received the news that our division commander, Major General Feuchtinger, had been awarded the Knight's Cross as well. He had received it already on August 6th, 1944, the day of our advance on Montpensant. Apparently, his division's attack that we carried out had yielded the desired result, even though this successful attack might perhaps not have been the sole reason for Feuchtinger to be awarded his Knight's Cross. As I was now standing before Lieutenant Colonel Rauch, completely exhausted, I realized that the cross was apparently awarded not only for one's own personal acts of bravery. This was, however, what National Socialist propaganda always told us the award was for. Of course, I was aware that higher commanders were also awarded the Knight's Cross for their efforts. I have to say, however, that neither Feuchtinger nor Rauch had struck me as energetic military commanders. Feuchtinger, in particular, was always a controversial figure. Many rumors made the rounds among us officers about him and the women, and in addition, we had not forgotten about his absence during the first hours of the invasion. But he was also known for his close ties to Hitler which traced back all the way to the 1930s Nuremberg rallies. As for Rauch, on the other hand, I definitely regarded him to be a fair and responsible commander, but most of the time I could only find him with his staff far behind the front line. To be fair, my views about the whole situation might be a result of my subordinate perspective. It was just that, at a time where I had just returned from a difficult and bloody mission, where I had lost almost all of my company, I had a hard time accepting the awards my superiors had received as something they truly deserved. I realized that in wartime, each individual order could be awarded for its own unique reasons and bravery was just one of them. Lieutenant Colonel Rauch expressed his appreciation for my efforts. Lieutenant Hula, you're going to make it far, he told me. In the same breath, he ordered me to get some rest. On the loss of my company, he did not elaborate. What was left of it was integrated into another. I went to clean myself and my uniform as well as I could and looked for a place to sleep. In the very moment I had found a cot and laid down, I was already gone. Almost fifteen hours later I was roused and received orders to report back with Eighth Company. Still weary, I went on my way. Hell in the fillet's pocket, I arrived at Lassie in the evening of August 8th, where I reported to First Lieutenant Bratz. Our company was to repel the British armoured formations advancing southward. We found good positions in and around the village and immediately began shelling the previously reconnoitred British positions, which were roughly two miles west of Lassie, with our grenade launchers. My two self-propelled guns covered the main line of movement westward. 
They drove into house walls in reverse and nestled into the buildings, thus creating well-concealed defensive positions. Not a very considerate course of action, but in this situation, we had to take any measure necessary to improve our chances of survival. In the early hours, our forward posts had reported advancing tanks, and a moment later, everyone was lying in their dugouts. The British tanks only dared to close in on Lassie in a slow and deliberate manner. One of them was too bold, however, going forward directly on the road. My two self-propelled guns were in a favourable position, and at a distance of around a hundred yards, the crack of a cannon shot sounded. The British tank immediately came to a halt and started smoking. Luckily for its crew, it did not explode. The British managed to bail out and ran away. We watched the fleeing tankers without opening fire. After our successful kill, we allowed ourselves some time to inspect the enemy tank. While the vehicle itself was unusable, we were happy to find several crates of British provisions inside, a very welcome surprise which amazed us with its high-quality food. Everyone got a part of this gift, and we delightfully ate up all of it. After this armoured advance, the British settled for repeated artillery strikes and infantry scouting parties for some time. During this, I lost a man from my platoon, who was caught in an artillery strike just as he was out to relieve himself. A piece of shrapnel put an end to his young life. We found him lying in a field with his trousers down. Apart from the lethal shrapnel wound, he had not a single scratch. Our division's mission was now to enable the movement eastward of Fifth Panzer Army's withdrawing formations. Like a stinger, our unit was the last protruding west into the Allied lines. Over the next couple of days, the British were battering us from three sides. Due to repeated artillery bombardments, we had three more casualties within a short time. All wounds were serious injuries caused by the shrapnel of explosive shells. These could cause horrible wounds, sever whole limbs with one blow or even rupture the lungs through their shock waves. You were lucky to receive only light wounds. During a reconnaissance patrol of our near surroundings by one of our NCOs leading ten to twelve men, they managed to capture three British soldiers from a scouting party. Interrogation did not result in any intelligence which we did not already possess. Namely, that we were once again in danger of becoming surrounded. It was high time to withdraw eastward. Since we had barely any manpower to spare for guarding our prisoners, we decided to send them back to their comrades after a short interrogation. We gave them a white sheet and told them to march westward along the main road. Visibly puzzled but understandably relieved, they went away with their arms raised. Soon, enemy pressure on Lassie became too strong. There was a great danger of becoming surrounded. We found ourselves in the same situation we had been in before at Benouville and Mondeville. This time our battalion commander recognised the looming threat in time. In the following night, between August 11 and 12, our battalion withdrew roughly 1.2 miles eastward to St. Vigor, where we took up a new defensive position. As support, we received a Panzer Grenadier company from the battalion. It comprised a whopping 30 soldiers. That was not necessarily a staggering battle force. Our two companies formed a small battle group, which was tasked with covering our regiment's retreat westward. In the night before August 13th, 21st Panzer Division withdrew onto a line between La Chapelle and La Roque. Our battalion was now the division's rear guard. As we were shifting more and more towards the east, our front became less and less coherent. German troops were streaming past us. All tried to escape into the east. Together with the leader of the Panzer Grenadier company assigned to us, I decided to reconnoitre into the north. The situation around us was quickly becoming more chaotic, and we wanted to find out how far the enemy was away, or whether they had even overtaken us already. My plan was approved, and so the two of us drove off in my Kubelwagen. Ahead of us, on a hill, there was a large farmstead which could be seen from all directions. We wanted to have a closer look at it, as it appeared to be a good spot for looking over the area. We were also painfully aware, however, that this trip could end in our demise if the farmstead was already occupied by the enemy. We decided to not take any unnecessary risks during our reconnaissance. We left the Kubelwagen in the concealment of several bushes next to the road and kept going on foot. In addition, we left our submachine guns in the car and only took our pistols with us, which we kept holstered. If the British were to encounter us in such an unarmed state, 
We thought our chances better for them to not open fire on us immediately, but rather call out from a distance in the hopes of capturing us without a fight. We sneaked our way forward. Our nerves were strung to breaking point. A lone soldier with a submachine gun and loose trigger finger could have led to our demise. We trusted in our obviously displayed inferiority. With utmost tension, we reached the farmstead. We spotted a man, apparently the farmer, busying himself with clearing out his cattle's dung. Calm and placid, as if it was blissful peacetime and not August 1944. We slowly went closer to the farmer. When he saw us, he paused for a moment before leaning onto his pitchfork and staring at us. In an inquiring tone, I said, Anglais. Non, he muttered sullenly before resuming his work. It was as clear as day that we were not welcome here. Perhaps he was irritated by still encountering German soldiers and not allied ones. We tried to get a look from the hill on the surrounding area. There were pillars of smoke rising from burning vehicles and buildings all around. We could also spot enemy aircraft far away. There was no unmistakable sign of advancing enemy forces, however, the situation was still not clear. We decided to go back again, as moving forward even further would have been pointless. Back at the battle group, we reported our observations to our superior commanders, but the battalion could not give us any additional information about the situation around us either. Only one thing was clear. There would be no such thing as holding the line anymore. Whenever we caught sight of the Tommies, we would open fire and then withdraw to the next favourable position. Most of the time, it was British armoured scout cars rushing over the road before halting for a moment to scan the area with their rotating turrets. One or two high explosive rounds usually sufficed in ending such incautious activities. In one of these actions, one of my guns managed to light a British scout car on fire. The gun was in a good firing position. When the scout car slowly passed behind a wrecked German truck and closed in, it was already done for. A short order to fire, and our first shell struck right on target. We watched from a safe distance as a few of the crew members bailed out and the armoured car eventually burned up completely. But these advances by the British were always followed closely by Allied fighter bombers, which then circled above us like vultures. During these times we were effectively paralysed and each of us hoped that there were no British tanks following these scout cars. In that case we would have been doomed, as the fighter bombers would have prevented us from withdrawing in time, and we had nothing to withstand a massed armoured attack. Our two self-propelled guns would have only bought the shortest amount of time. Fortune was still on our side, however, and our small battle group kept up the slow fighting retreat towards the east. Some of the German formations around us were disintegrating completely, and time and again we had stragglers come in and join our ranks. Soldiers from the infantry divisions were most often appearing especially distraught. Some of them just sat down and could not be moved to march on with us. The relentless Allied attacks had brought them to the very end of their tether. There was nothing we could do for them.